Welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. This is a daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of God's Word. Hello again. My name is Russ Brewer, and we are studying the key chapters of the Bible together. Welcome. Today, we're going to be going through Deuteronomy chapter 28. And if you've been keeping up through all this time, and and even if you're running a little bit behind, congratulations. It is so great that you are working through the Word of God this way, and hopefully you're learning more about Him, and hopefully you're seeing how our Lord's message fits together with this incredible, powerful, underlying point that God is God, and He is calling people to Himself, and He is telling us what that means and what that looks like like to walk with him. Well, today we're turning to Deuteronomy 28. Deuteronomy 28 is a great chapter, but it is going to be heavily influenced by Deuteronomy 27. So we're going to take a few minutes to look at that as well. And although we have been going through Deuteronomy rather quickly, we are seeing just how important this book is to the life of the ancient Jewish person or even today. And as we turn to Deuteronomy 28, This chapter is giving us just a concrete example of why following God is the wisest and best course of action we could choose, and why disobeying Him is the most foolish and painful course of life we could choose. This chapter is giving us a summary of the blessings of walking in fellowship with God, and also a summary of the curses for rebelling against Him. Let's start with the blessings, which are in verses 1 to 14. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 1 says, Now it shall be, if you diligently obey the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments which I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. And verses 2 to 8 explains what that will look like. And just going to drop into a few verses here to there. Uh, They're going to be blessed in the city. They'll be blessed in their country. They'll be blessed in their agriculture. They'll be blessed in their bread. They'll be blessed with victory over their enemies. In verse 9, the Lord will establish them. In verse 10, the whole world will know that they are God's special people. In verse 11, they will abound in prosperity. Verse 13, the Lord will make them the head and not the tail, which means that they'll just be in a place of blessings. They're not going to be slaves. They're not going to be beholden to other people. They'll kind of be in charge. But notice the requirement that the Lord gives in verse 2. If you obey the Lord your God. Verse 9. If you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways. Verse 13. If you listen to the commandments of the Lord your God, which I charge you today to observe them carefully. Verse 14. And do not turn aside from any of the words which I command you today, to the right or to the left, to go after other gods to serve them. And so there's all these blessings that come from just walking with the Lord. He is a God of grace and blessings. And what we're doing when we walk with him in obedience, we are in a place where we can receive those blessings, where we are rightly positioned to have him just pour them out upon us. But if we rebel against him, he can't bless us because we're on a course that's in rebellion to him. And if he were to bless us, that would be encouraging us to continue to rebel against him and sin against him and try to pursue our own way rather than his way. And his way is always the best way. So look what happens if they do not obey. Verse 15, But it shall come about, if you do not obey the Lord your God, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I charge you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. And notice, just glancing quickly down at verse 47, what it looks like to, in a way, not obey the Lord, or the reverse would be true, what it would look like to obey In verse 47, he says, Because you did not serve the Lord your God with joy and a glad heart for the abundance of all things. And so the Lord is not looking for external obedience to the letter of the law. He's looking for a joyful gladness of one who trusts God's ways and his wisdom and wants to walk with him and honor him. And if God's people come to the point where they don't want to walk with him this way and they don't believe that his ways are the best ways, well, they will experience the cursings in the rest of this chapter. And so if you look at verses 16 and 19, it's really the reversal of God's blessings. In verse 20, they'll have confusion. Verse 21, they'll have sickness. In verse 23, the skies will be bronze above them and the earth will be iron beneath them. Verse 25, they'll be defeated by their enemies. Verse 37, they will be a horror and a proverb and a taunt of foolishness. Verse 53, the delicate man will be hostile to his family. Verse 56, the delicate woman will be hostile to her husband and children. Finally, in verse 68, God will send them back to Egypt. And what a list of curses that are being warned of God's people here in this passage. 
In fact, even God's warning about, I'll send you back to Egypt, uh, that was carried out later on. In Jeremiah 44, he also warns about that. And then later, a few decades after the Jewish folks put Jesus to death, in 70 AD, the Romans came in and sent at least 17,000 people back to Egypt as slaves. And so the Lord gives a severe warning here. And he's saying, I will bless you abundantly if you walk with me, but you will also experience my judgment and my curse if you don't. And so this is an important chapter, but not just because of the warnings of blessing and curses here, but also because of how this chapter fits into the rest of the history of the people of God. For instance, glance back at chapter 27. You can read this chapter later on when we're done with the podcast, but I'm just going to show you a few things in this passage here, which is going to tell the Jewish people what to do with the blessings and curses that we see in Deuteronomy 28. So in verse 2, it says, So it shall be on the day when you cross the Jordan, that would be when they go into the promised land, to the land which the Lord your God gives you, that you shall set up for yourself large stones and coat them with lime and write on them all the words of this law. Going down to verse 5, they are to build an altar. Then glance down to verse 12. They're going to go to a mountain called Mount Gerizim, which they may not even know what this mountain is or at this point, but they're going to find it out later on. They're going to go to Mount Gerizim. They're going to take half of the tribes and put them on Mount Gerizim to bless them. Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Joseph, and Benjamin. And then verse 13. They're going to take the other half of the tribes and put them on Mount Ebal for the curse. That would be Reuben, Gad, Asher, Zebulun, Dan, and Naphtali. And so here they are coming to the end of the book of Deuteronomy. They're soon to go into the promised land. Moses is going to be dying soon. But here they have this instruction that when they get into the promised land, they're to put half the tribes on Mount Gerizim, half the tribes on Mount Ebal. They're to read the blessings and the curses and look how the people are to respond. At the end of verse 15, all the people shall say amen. Verse 16, and all the people shall say amen. Verse 17, and all the people shall say amen. And all the way on through, they are to read these blessings and these curses, and the people are to say amen and amen and amen, affirming their truth. So did this happen? Well, yes, it did. Now let's turn our Bibles over to the book of Joshua. Joshua is only a few pages away. In fact, Joshua chapter 8, because we're almost at the end of Deuteronomy, it's not that far over to the right. Joshua chapter 8, if you go to the end of the chapter, you'll see where they fulfill this instruction. And so in verse 30 of Joshua 8, it says, Then Joshua built an altar to the Lord, the God of Israel, in Mount Ebal, just as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded the sons of Israel, as it is written in the book of the law of Moses. And it goes on to describe what they, uh, what they built the altar like. And then it says in verse 33, And all Israel, with their elders and officers and their judges, were standing on both sides of the ark before the Levitical priests who carried the ark of the covenant of the Lord, the stranger as well as the native. Half of them stood in front of Mount Gerizim, half of them stood in front of Mount Ebal, just as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had given command at the first to bless the people of Israel. Then afterwards, he read all the words of the law, the blessings and the curse, according to all that is written in the book of the law, There was not a word of all that Moses had commanded, which Joshua did not read before all the assembly of Israel, with the women and the little ones and the strangers who were living among them. And so from the very beginning, we see that the people of God were obedient to him. They were obedient to the instructions to do this, as well as they were obedient to the principles behind it, the principles of obedience, the principles of walking in God's blessings. Now, this is an important event in the history of the Jewish people. But eventually, there was some confusion that came in. And and this event serves as a backdrop to a conversation Jesus has with a woman at the well in Samaria in John chapter 4. Now, the details of what got to John 4 is a bit too complex to go into right now. But suffice this to say, over the centuries, the region that this part is part of is eventually going to be called Samaria, and it was filled with Samaritans. And Samaritans were a mixture of kind of quasi-Jewish, quasi-not Jewish people. They rejected large parts of the Old Testament and pretty much just wanted to make up their own thing. And what they did was they built a temple on top of Mount Gerizim. Because remember, Mount Gerizim was the mountain where there was all the blessings that were being read. And so they wanted to be people of blessing. And so they built a temple on top of that mountain. And they had this idea that if they would go worship God there, he would bless them. And so their worship was known for it's just its joyful praise, its enthusiasm, its excitement, because they were going to be getting all of these blessings because of their worship. And Jesus comes to the base of this mountain when he meets the woman at the well. The well is at the base of this mountain. And they have a critical conversation 
essentially referring back to this event or at least alluding to it when they discuss what is the kind of worship God seeks. And so why don't you turn your Bible to John chapter 4, starting in verse 19. John 4, 19, the woman is talking with Jesus. She says, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. She was recognizing that because he's just spoken of her past. And so since she's talking to an actual man of God who actually walks with God, she wants to know from him, how do I worship? And so she says in verse 20, Our fathers worshiped in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. And so she's basically saying, okay, so the whole Mount Gerizim thing, is it for real? Or shall we go worship with you all back in Jerusalem? And Jesus says to her in verse 21, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. In other words, we need to worship God truthfully and accurately, yes, from our hearts, but it has to be based on truth. Remember back in Deuteronomy 28, verse 47, where it says, Because you did not serve the Lord your God with joy and a glad heart for the abundance of all things, and therefore you shall serve your enemies, it goes on with the curse. But the point is that God wanted us to serve him with joy and a glad heart because we love him and we trust his wisdom and we trust his ways and we want to walk with him and fellowship with him. And so true worship is from our heart and it's by truth. In other words, true worship is truly recognizing God's wisdom and his ways and praising him and celebrating him for all that he is and all that he does. He's a great and glorious, faithful God. And that's really the takeaway in all of this. You see, Deuteronomy 28 is a promise that God is faithful. He is faithful to bless those who will obey him and walk with him. And he is also faithful to give incentive for those who rebel against him. The blessings that we receive are often not material, but they are very real blessings. They are things like peace with the people in our life, joy in what we're doing, God giving us wisdom as we go through life and find unpredictable challenges coming our way. Sometimes, though, they are very much literal blessings. I wouldn't say they are the health and wealth that some people say, but they are often very much actual blessings. We can look in our life and say, wow, uh, this thing I have, this person in my life, these are such blessings. God gives us those blessings because he loves us and he is just a good, gracious God. I wouldn't want to make life about material blessings, but God is faithful at every level. And I truly believe that the wisest and best course of life is to obey him, not because of just some kind of theoretical Oh, it's best to do what God wants or he's going to hit me with a lightning bolt. But because when we walk with God, we are walking with a good and gracious God who loves to pour blessings upon us. Likewise, I also find that God does discipline us too. And the discipline can come in various forms and kind of somewhat like what we see in Jeremiah 28. You know, we're looking, it's like, wow, I just feel that God's not blessing this situation. If anything, he's judging this situation. And I think that's, again, because God cannot truly bless a person who is on a path of rebellion. And so he's going to be withholding his blessings so that he would be calling us back to him. Remember, Hebrews chapter 12 talks about how God has the loving discipline of a father to his child to instruct us in the right way. We need to remember that God's discipline of his children, it's not punishment. It's not because he wants to make us miserable and he's, he's just you know, going to make us pay. It's because he's trying to get our attention so we would come back to him, so we would have the joyful hearts to recognize, oh, his ways are the right way. He is gracious and good and wise, and we would just rejoice in him. The discipline he brings into our life is to bring us back to that place where we belong. And so for the final takeaway here, if you have found the Lord's ways to be wise, why not end this time praising him for the wisdom of his ways, for the blessings he has given to your life? You know, they always say we should count our blessings. Maybe just spend some time thanking the Lord for the ways he has blessed you. Or if you're convicted that you've not been walking in his ways and you're seeing things that look a lot more like the curses and the judgment of this passage, why not repent and ask for his grace to make changes to your life, to make changes to your will, to guide you to a path where you're walking in obedience to him. God's ways are always the best ways. And when we walk in them, we will walk in his blessings and joy. 